Hello everyone, this video is going to provide a brief introduction to our next module which is uh, Experimental Film Component 2 Section D and Experimental Film is, is part of a film movement and what we're going to study is Pulp Fiction and um, we need to study the core study areas and also special study areas of narrative and auteur theory and our task is to show how each of the above areas are experimental when compared to mainstream Hollywood cinema so for component 2 section D it is a single film study uh, and you will be expected to answer one of two questions. Now the questions will focus on the experimental nature of Pulp Fiction uh, and effectively you'll be, what you want to show in the exam is how, uh, it's your understanding of how Pulp Fiction, whether that be in terms of narrative, a directorial approach, uh, whatever it is, how it is different from mainstream cinema. So experimental film is one that challenges the expectations of the audience and adopts unconventional approaches to cinema. And we've got three examples on screen and each, you know, ex experimental to varying degrees, but all try and do something a little bit more uh, out of the ordinary. And it's also a film that does not have to be completely unique, artistic or, or unlike anything else to be considered experimental. And experimental films basically challenge the traditional approach uh, or the Hollywood approach to mainstream film production and that's what we're going to look at in this module. Okay, so experimental films then are not produced with the box office or commercial success in mind and mainstream cinemas are more likely or, or less likely to screen them because they're not going to generate a profit and experimental films aim at niche audiences who actively seek out challenging and subversive films. So experimental films are made for an appeal to those um, film fans or audiences who actually look for something a bit unusual, a bit unique or something that uh, operates outside of mainstream uh, convention. Now there is a, t um, a danger that we start to find an independent film as experimental um, but we will come back to that in later lessons. Today's lesson is just to introduce the module and set up your work for today which is to look at the work of Tarantino. Okay so just to briefly finish uh, on experimental film we can identify experimental films or the experimental nature of a film in many, many different ways. But these are the three uh, approaches I'd suggest uh, to start out. So you can look at technique. Does the director subvert audience expectations when using key elements? So, for example, do the experiment with sound? So if you think back to No Country for All Men, the film does not have a score. Now, that would be considered a mainstream film uh, according to our exam boards, but there is an experimental approach to sound design. Does the film allow, or does, is the film a vehicle for the director to develop their own personal style? If so, that could contribute to the film's experimental nature. The film could work outside of genres, so generally experimental films are hard to categorise uh, and sort of pinpoint within a genre, but that's obviously because they are rejecting traditional approaches, and that also applies to narrative as well. Uh, and you could also look at the rejection of narrative forms, or narrative in any form. And then subject matter. So experimental films tend to challenge prevailing attitudes, they reject social or political norms, they present non-mainstream views, they will often deal with directly or indirectly what we call taboo topics. Uh, and a lot of experimental film is deeply personal filmmaking and it's a personal expression of the filmmaker. So as I said, we will come back to experimental film and go through that in a lot more detail in future lessons, but today's lesson is about ex is setting up uh, our director, Quentin Tarantino, and trying to answer the question, is he an auteur and is he, is he an experimental filmmaker? So this special study area um, for this module is auteur and, uh, as well as narrative. And as you can see on the board, you've got a, a screenshot of the exam board's um, specification. And they say in order to be successful, what you have to show is how auteur auteurs through the imprint of their signature features can make a significant impact on a film's messages and values. So we, we've chatted about authorship and what author theory sort of signifies or what it means in lessons, so I'm not going to spend too much time going over that again. I will just provide a quick overview as a recap. Uh, but author, so author basically means author, and the author theory is an attempt to identify the single or sole creator or originator of a work of art. Or to put it more accurately, it's trying to identify the, um, the overarching creative uh, control or input into a film, which individual is the creative force behind the film. And obviously film is collaborative, so Auteur Theory is open for a lot of criticism and you can pinpoint holes in it, but that's not the, so that's not the focus of this essay, so we're not going to dwell on that here. 
Okay, so a note here then, uh, and this is a quote from John Coffey's uh, book on authorship, um, Theories of Authorship, which is available in class and in the library, and, he, and Coffey says, quote, For a director who is genuinely an artist or a auteur, a film is more than likely to be an expression of his or her individual personality, and that this personality can be traced in a thematic and thus stylistic consistency over all or most of the director's films. And that effectively is what an auteur is. It's being able to identify a personal vision through the use of signature and repeated convention in their work. So a very, very brief history of auteur. So in the classic era, the Hollywood studios dominated the filmmaking and production processes and also exhibition and distribution and actors, stars, uh, and anyone who worked within the, the production side of the film was contracted to a studio. And the studios ran a very factory-like approach. Okay, So each studio, for example, Universal, would adopt a house style, which was horror, or gothic horror in particular. And they would just continually produce... Uh, the same old films, churning them out again and again and again. And this was very successful for a while, but what it meant was that the director was not really the most creative or important person on a film. It was the producer, and in particular the studio head, who, like Louis V. Mayer on screen, he was the author of the MGM style, and they dictated the type of films that were made in the studio, but also the approach. Now, what happened after that, though, is that when the studio started to collapse uh, at the end of the, well, during the 1950s, um, the power sort of left producers because audience moved away from cinema. And what happened is that there was a, a more of an attempt to um, appeal, well, basically give individual directors a bit more control over the work in an attempt to present new types of cinema that draw audiences back to the uh, bo uh, well, you know, increased box office. Now, what happened is, though, is that um, directors like John Huston, uh, John Ford, who would be very, very successful auteurs under the studio system, they actually, when they left the studio system, their work actually decreased in quality, so that raises a very interesting question about auteur theory itself, that maybe some of these directors need the framework of a studio or need a producer's framework to sort of guide their vision. So, again, it opens up the question about auteur being a very, uh, sorry, cinema being a collaborative medium, uh, but that's basically the origin of auteur theory in a few minutes. Okay, so after auteur theory, um, you know, travelled from France to America, it was sort of codified or sort of written as a theory by American film scholar Andrew Saris. And his ultimate question was, how do you tell a quasi, so the how do you tell a genuine director from a quasi chimpanzee? Uh, and Aris said, or Sarah said, basically, there's three ways you do that. So a filmmaker must have technical competence, and I would. Based, I would, you know, I would encourage you to re remember that as technical excellence. Obviously, all directors must be competent to a certain level to work in Hollywood uh, continually. Uh, but what we're talking about is technical excellence in the sense that an auteur will not be limited by the technical restraint of the technology. They will develop new technologies and they will be able to creatively reimagine or reinvent ways to use that technology to express their vision. So an auteur will not allow their vision to be compromised, whereas a meta on scene or lesser filmmaker maybe would. So the second feature is that signature features. So uh, across their body of work or oeuvre, a filmmaker must exhibit certain recurring signature features or characteristics of style which act as their signature. And finally, their films must demonstrate interior meaning. So again, I've already explained technical competence, but Truffaut argued that a true artist will reject the use of montage editing in favour of mise-en-scene, while his contemporary Alexander Astruc added that auteur an auteur should wield the camera like a writer uses a pen. That auteur should not be restricted by the traditional modes of filmmaking. So as I said earlier, it's about using the technology available to express uh, a personal idea or ideology or a personal worldview and not being hindered by that technology. So the example we use in class is Hitchcock, you know, the classic quintessential auteur, but when he was making Vertigo, he wanted to express a psychological sensation visually. Now, the technology didn't exist to do that, so he basically invented the camera shots, the reverse dolly zoom. A lesser filmmaker or a meta on scene may have done the vert so-called Vertigo shot with a series of, um, you know, jarring um, jump cuts, uh, but it wouldn't have been, been as effective. So Hitchcock, you know, he transcended the technology almost to uh, reinvent a new mode or a new piece of the language. Okay, number two. 
Uh, these are signature features or characteristics of style. So we can look at key elements, so the use of sounds, edit and mise on scene and performance, and look for consistent features there. So Martin Scorsese uses a lot of 1950s and 1960s, you know, Italian crooners in his soundtracks. He uses long tracking shots. He consistently uses uh, Thelma Shoemaker as his editor. So again, we have those reoccurring elements and his work is recognisable. And I suggest if you want to understand the auteur theory, study Martin Scorsese and then watch the opening of The Irishman. The Irishman opens with a long tracking shot, which is one of his signature features. Uh, it's got a priest, a statue of the Virgin Mary. Uh, it's got prayers and it's got a gangster and it's got Italian crooner music. It's like it's peak Scorsese and it is basically his entire, you know, auteur approach condensed to one shot. It's, it's incredible. Okay, number two, uh, you can look at structural elements. So auteurs tend to reject traditional approaches to narrative and genre and will often try to subvert the rules of classical filmmaking. So if you look at Christopher Nolan, he consistently um, rejects traditional linear narrative approaches in, in many senses and he, he, he opts to play around with uh, narrative and narrative devices. And then you can look for reoccurring themes. So some directors may have a fascination with certain topics or certain ideologies. So you can look for them in their work as well. So one of the things we'll talk about, and I don't want this to be a major part of our essay, but it's a bit of a cliche that's always brought up about Tarantino, is, is the fascination of women's or female feet. That is clearly um, seen in all of his work, and that is a small signifier of his auteur status. Okay, then interior meaning is probably the most complex and most difficult to wrap our heads around, and, and you know, Saris doesn't help. So Saris defines interior meaning or explains interior meaning, quote, is extrapolated from the tension between a director's personality and the material. So what he's talking about there are preoccupations of the director, whether that be themes, ideas, it could be psych or, you know, psychological preoccupation like we see with Hitchcock, with his obsession with the blonde, the punishment of women, uh, the fear of police. These are all elements of Hitchcock's own personal psychology and backgrounds that are imprinted and embedded within his work. Whether that's conscious or subconscious, it doesn't really matter at this stage. The point is, it's there and it's an expression of, of his world view. Okay. So, the tasks for this lesson, auteur, tasks for Quentin Tarantino, very simple really, uh, is, is Tarantino an auteur? I think yes is the answer, uh, and it may be a reluctant answer for some people, but he is definitely an auteur. So what you need to do is demonstrate your understanding of his auteur status. Now, as I've said many times in class, there's only one real way to do this, and it's to watch all of his films. So, you know, I know we're, off a, we're taking a Christmas break, but... Students love Quentin Tarantino's films. He's only got nine or ten of them, so it shouldn't be too much of a stretch to watch three or four before you return. But what I want you to do today is just research Tarantino's background, his films, watch YouTube clips, watch extracts from his films, read articles, and create a PowerPoint or a Sway or a Word document. Uh, that should be quite detailed, by the way. Uh, that details your understanding of Tarantino's OTA status. So you can look at technical competence, or you to identify moments from the films or Tarantino's films that you think demonstrate his technical competence. So you must provide technical analysis support on these points you are making. So it's not enough to just bullet point stuff. You need to identify the ways he is technically competent, pick one example, and provide a little bit of analysis. So explain to me why the clip you have chosen or the extracts you've chosen demonstrates Tarantino's technical competence or excellence. Once we've done that, we can move on to the more, uh, maybe more interesting or slightly easier part of the task, which is to look for stylistic consistencies. So you need to research uh, a list of repeated elements of Quentin Tarantino's work, and they could be stylistic, um, they could be in terms of you know his use of music. Uh, like like Hitchcock, does he depict women in a certain way? And this list should be quite exhaustive and detailed because there's quite a lot written about Tarantino, so you should be able to draw quite a lot from that. And also don't forget, you are the primary source on this, so you should, if you've watched any of his films, start by noting down what are the things that link his work, why do you like his work, and then build from there. But you must use the internet and you must use watch clips to complete this task properly. And finally, do you notice any examples of interior meaning or themes, representations or obsessions that are specific to Quentin Tarantino? Now we've mentioned the uh, so-called foot fetish. Uh, that's one, but as I said, we want to avoid using that as a major point. It's a minor point in the exam that demonstrates 
you know, it allows you to demonstrate you know what you're talking about in terms of theory, but then you should need to dive deeper. So spend a lot of time researching Quentin Tarantino's background, you know, the fact he used to work in a video store, he does not have a formal education in film. I think these are quite evident when you look at his films uh, in the amount of, so let's be kind and say homages, he pays to other, other work. So just to recap, uh, the tasks are on, on the board now. I want you to create a Sway, a PowerPoint or a Word document that contains uh, a very detailed overview of Quentin Tarantino's OTA status. And the task is broken down into three stages on the board. Um, and look, you may realise that some of the elements, um, some of the questions or some of the information you find may overlap. You don't have to be too rigid with your work. I don't necessarily expect three big sections. What I want you to do is show you understand this guy's filmmaking or OTA status and you can present your work in any way that you like uh, if you want to make a YouTube video I'd greatly encourage that if you want to do a audio recording and send me that that would be fantastic if not I'll expect words PowerPoint or sway documents um, at the end of the lesson so if you've got any questions I'll be available on teams you know me email 